In February 1993, approximately 130 men, women, and children lived in a large house just outside Waco, Texas, on property they called the Mount Carmel Center. The leader of this group was 33-year-old Vernon Howell, who later changed his name to David Koresh. David believed he had been asked by God to deliver the message of the book of Revelations in the Bible to the world. Rachel, David's wife, and their three children also lived at Mount Carmel. The Mount Carmel property was established as a religious retreat by its founders in 1935. Followers came to be known as Branch Davidians. In 60 years, there had been only one incident in an otherwise unblemished record of the Branch Davidians' peaceful existence with their neighbors. Former leader George Roden's wife gave leadership of the group to Koresh. Roden then unearthed a dead woman in her coffin and challenged Koresh to see who could raise the dead woman. Koresh called the police, who said they needed evidence. Koresh and several followers went to the ranch to take pictures of the coffin, and Roden opened fire. Roden was shot in the finger. Koresh and seven others were arrested. All were later acquitted. Former leader George Roden also accused David Koresh of getting his 75-year-old mother pregnant. He raped my mother. In response, David replied, If I took a 70-year-old woman and got her pregnant, you better watch out. <laughs> I'm God. This statement, obviously said sarcastically, was repeated out of context over and over in the news media and by the FBI in the next weeks to portray David Koresh as having claimed he was God. Many people at Mount Carmel held responsible jobs in the outside community. Wayne Martin was a well-known and respected Harvard-educated lawyer. Sherry Jewell was a computer analyst and teacher. David Jones was a mailman. Mike Schroeder and Woody Kendricks were craftsmen. Church services were no different than what you'd expect at any church service. His tongue is the pit of a... So how's God going to talk to me in the latter days? And who's going to bring that book? So there'll be no excuses! The Branch Davidians were well-liked by many of their neighbors. And the Branch Davidians had some distinguished neighbors over the years. Texas Governor Ann Richards grew up in Waco. William Sessions was the mayor and a judge in Waco before he became director of the FBI. ATF Director Stephen Higgins and FBI spokesman Bob Ricks both attended Baylor University in Waco. And President Clinton recently appointed a new commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. She, too, is from Waco. The house was built by the labors of the people who lived there. What happened to target these seemingly peaceful and religious people for the wrath of the United States government? Around 1987, Mark Bro, a self-proclaimed prophet from Honolulu, Hawaii, joined the Branch Davidians at Mount Carmel. He was asked to leave in 1989 when he tried to take over the leadership of the Mount Carmel Center from David Koresh. Mark Bro vowed revenge. He called several international agencies and made allegations against David Koresh of adulterous sex, child abuse, and gun stockpiling. One of the groups he contacted was Cult Awareness Network, a group that helps to arrange kidnappings and deprogramming of people who join religious groups. Deprogramming is a form of brainwashing. Cult Awareness Network pushed for investigations of the Branch Davidians. In 1992, Mark Bro was provided a golden opportunity to get his revenge when a disc jockey named David Jewell became embroiled in a custody battle with his wife, Sherry Jewell a Branch Davidian who lived at Mount Carmel. Mark Bro approached David Jewell's mother to tell his sordid tales of sex, abuse, and guns. He then later testified at the custody hearing. In an interview with an Australian network in 1991, David Koresh himself answered these claims. How many wives do you have? One. One wife. One, one wife. Have you I've committed? always had... Have I committed adultery? Would you fix that? Have you, have you committed adultery? <laughs> no, I don't commit adultery. You telling me the truth? I am telling you the truth. Have you beaten children? No, I do not beat children. I think the girl's name was Aisha. Yeah, but was her parents there? Her parents were there. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. 
Nonetheless, these very same allegations made their way into the search warrant affidavit written by alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agent Davy Aguilera on February 25, 1993. The ATF is responsible for seeing that taxes are paid on certain types of guns and enforcing federal gun laws. Why would these allegations be included in an application to search for weapons violations? The ATF has no authority to investigate child abuse or polygamy. And these allegations were investigated by the Texas Welfare Department and the McLennan County Sheriff's Department in 1991 and 1992 and were found to be baseless. Parts of the search warrant affidavit by Agent Aguilera were false. Here, Agent Aguilera refers to Shotgun News, a national newspaper with a circulation of 150,000 that is sold at newsstands all over the country. He calls it a clandestine newspaper. The affidavit describes how an undercover agent had observed the upper and lower receivers of disassembled AK-47s. The AK-47 has a one-piece receiver. There are no separate upper and lower receivers on an AK-47. Obviously, Agent Aguilera didn't have a clue, and Magistrate Green failed to notice. Agent Aguilera also stated that a neighbor heard machine gun fire, but he didn't state that the McLennan County Sheriff had already investigated this claim and found that David Koresh had a legal device called a Hellfire trigger that merely sounds like a machine gun, but is perfectly legal. Machine gun fire in itself is not evidence of illegal activity. It is legal to own a machine gun if the owner pays a $200 tax on the gun. But there was no evidence the Branch Davidians owned any machine gun at all. So, bottom line, the raid on February 28, 1993 was launched because the ATF merely suspected that the Branch Davidians might have a machine gun that they had failed to pay a $200 tax on. Branch Davidian Paul Fatta, who was responsible for many gun purchases, states categorically, There is no 50 caliber machine gun out there. There is a 50 caliber gun that's a semi-automatic that was bought perfectly legal. Aguilera also failed to mention that in July 1992, the ATF had inspected Hewitt Arms, a gun and gun parts store in Waco where the Branch Davidians had purchased 225 guns. Henry McMahon, the former owner of Hewitt Arms, told Pete Zorales of the Mobile Press that when the ATF agents visited Hewitt Arms in July 1992, I called David and told him the agents have a problem with you buying so many guns. He said, tell him to come on out. The ATF agents declined this offer. Magistrate Dennis Green, the only U.S. magistrate in Waco, and himself a former U.S. attorney, issued the search warrant for the Mount Carmel property. An article in the August 30, 1992 Waco Tribune Herald revealed that the small town of Waco had an extraordinarily high rate of federal gun prosecutions compared to the rest of the nation, under the direction of Bill Johnstone, the U.S. attorney in Waco. This high rate of prosecutions in Waco for gun law violations may well come from the ATF's and Magistrate Green's ignorance of federal gun laws. Although Agent Aguilera claims in the affidavit to be experienced and to know about federal firearms laws, he confuses the meanings of the words machine gun, destructive device, explosive, and explosive device, all of which have different, specific meanings in the federal law books. Magistrate Dennis Green failed to notice. Nonetheless, reporters at the Waco Tribune Herald began a scandalous series of articles about the Branch Davidians the day before the ATF raid. The reporters claimed to have interviewed former cult members. The allegations sounded amazingly like the allegations of Mark Bro and the Cult Awareness Network members. This diagram depicts the house at Mount Carmel as it appeared on the day of the raid by ATF on February 28, 1993. In press accounts, the ATF claimed that the raid was moved up a day after the ATF learned that the Waco Herald Tribune had started its series the day before. This was the first of many outright lies. The warrant would expire if it was not served by February 28th, and the raid took place on February 28th. What you are about to see 
is the first film footage of the initial raid as it was provided to all the network television feeds. This film was heavily edited by someone before it was distributed across the networks. It contains obvious glitches where film has been cut out. But even this editing wasn't enough to remove the truth. We'll show these next three scenes three times. Watch closely. In the opening scene, agents are in position behind cars, shooting at the front of the house, as two teams of four agents climb ladders on the side of the house to the roof. Now we'll replay what you just saw. Notice that there are no bullets hitting the ground or cars around any of these ATF agents. The three dark dots low on the horizon are helicopters. The sound of automatic weapons is coming from the M16 and MP5 machine guns used by the ATF agents. In the next scene, two teams of four agents were supposed to secure the roof within 30 seconds of arrival. Notice that no one is shooting at these agents as they climb the ladders. Several of these agents are carrying fully automatic rifles. The agent at the top right side just managed to shoot himself in the leg. Did you see it? We'll watch that again. The 9mm pistols carried by the ATF have no safety protection on them. As the agent climbs the ladder, he reaches for his gun in the holster. It discharges, wounding him in the leg and causing him to slip. He is able to continue up the ladder, however. According to ATF spokesman Royster, the raid on Mount Carmel had been planned and rehearsed for months. They drilled over and over again, and we had our plan down, we had a diversion down, all were put into effect, and they were waiting. Next we see three of the four agents on the roof breaking into the window. Let's watch this part again. No one is shooting at these agents. The shooting you were hearing is from the agents on the ground in front of the house. Notice that the agent is carrying two types of grenades on his belt. He also is carrying a smoke grenade. Both agents at the window toss in what appear to be smoke grenades. After these agents get through the window and into the room, you will briefly see the fourth agent on the roof, followed by one of those badly edited cuts in the film. The film picks up with the fourth agent tossing something into the room. It makes no sense for him to be throwing anything at all into a room where the three ATF agents have just gone, unless he intends to injure his own men. He also fires a machine gun into the room twice without looking. We'll watch it at normal speed, then slow it down. Now let's watch it in slow motion. Here he tosses something and withdraws his hand from the window. 
Next, without looking, he fires a burst from his machine gun into the room. Someone begins shooting from inside and bullet holes appear in the wall. In the midst of this gunfire, three holes appear at the same time. The agent fires his machine gun into the room a second time. He's then hit by a round. The bullet strikes him in his helmet on the back side of his head. He falls to the roof and grabs his head. This agent is not hurt, and he later makes it safely down the ladder. Regardless of who is shooting from inside that room, this agent just threw what appears to have been a grenade and fired a machine gun twice into the room where his three fellow ATF agents have just gone. All three of the agents who were sent into the window were killed. All three were Bill Clinton's bodyguards during his presidential campaign. A fourth agent was killed that day before the shooting started as he exited the cattle car. We're extremely proud of what happened out there, how our agents conducted themselves under some unbelievable circumstances. They did a fantastic job. David Koresh says... They fired on his first...